All right. And just know that coming up next week, we've got a session with Jamboard um, uh, with Sherry Walker. That is by popular demand. She has presented in the past and people have requested that she come back and show any updates and go through Jamboard again. That's the online um, uh, whiteboard, interactive whiteboard available through Google Meet and through Google. Um, then October 20th, I will be talking about Chromebook accessibility. So make sure you get registered for those once the registration information comes out. Why are we doing office hours? We have been doing office hours for a couple of years now to meet the needs across the region, talking about assistive, te assistive technology and making sure that we're sharing resources. Um, but keep in mind your why of why you are here. What are you here to learn and what are you hoping to get out of this? We always think through the set framework and that's looking through the student, the environments, the tasks and the tools and always keeping that lens of equity to make sure that every student is getting exactly what it is that they need. All right, and so we'll get started today with having some sharing by our guest, Krista Sievertson. We'll make sure that we have some time for questions and answers. And there's, um, at the end of the slides, there's some additional resources and a wrap up too for you that if we have time, we'll go through those too. And so I'm so happy to introduce to you Krista Sievertson. She is also a member of our Region 3 AT community of practice, and she is the ASD specialist at Duluth Edison. And I will turn it over to you, Krista. I'll stop sharing my slides. Thanks, Julie. And I will quickly find mine. All right, can you see my screen? Yep. Looks Excellent. Great. All right. So today I am coming to you to talk about structured teaching and structured teaching comes to us from the University of North Carolina's Teach Autism program. Uh, although it is designed for students with autism, it can be used for students at any level of learning and um, really with any um, level of, of need. These are instructional strategies and environmental supports that we put in place for our students. And this pyramid over on the right hand side kind of gives us the outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Really, when we're doing structured teaching, we want to start out with the physical structure of our environment and um, build up from there to making sure we, our students have their schedules. We have work systems in place and we're going to talk really in depth. Well, as much as we can in like 20 minutes about <laughs> what those work systems look like. Um, and then the routine and visual strategies and visual structure of the materials that we have in place for our students. So when we are doing structured teaching, we are always trying to answer these five questions for our students. And you may have seen this um, if you've learned about structured teaching before as four questions, but I've added in here um, the where, which is um, where the students should be, what activity they are doing, what work they're doing, or how long will that work last? How do they know they're making progress on the work and that they've finished? And then of course, what will they do next? So if you're doing structured teaching, you want to make sure that whatever activity you're doing, your students are able to answer these questions. I should mention too that this is a very condensed version of a training that I did in August with Jill Pring. And um, I'm going to give you some links to more information about that at the end. But for today's, today's training, uh, we're going to answer those five questions for you. Um, so where should you be right now? At your computer, what work are you doing? You're gonna watch the structured teaching office hours. How much? We've got about 40 slides. When we're done at 12.30 and what's next is gonna be your choice. So you can do a structured teaching really with anyone from preschool up to adult learners. When we talk about structured teaching, that very bottom of the pyramid was environmental structure. And um, that's really that physical structure that you put in place in the classroom that's the foundation of having a structured teaching environment in your classroom. And I really like this quote, uh, when, you when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. I'm a gardener and you know that if something's not going right with a plant, you don't just rip it out or cut off the flower. You're gonna wanna amend the soil, um, maybe move it to a different spot with better lighting. Um, there's maybe water it differently. So there's a lot of things that you want you can do to help um, your students with their environment. And when we do that, we're able to do things like increase their on-task behavior organization, increase their engagement, and help maybe reduce some of that sensory stimulation that's in a typical classroom. Now this 
uh, is an example here of using physical structure within a classroom. And it's a picture of what seems to be a very large space with lots of really great furniture that all matches. I'm sure you all have that in your rooms. Um, yeah, I know that we're not all dealing with ideal spaces, especially in special education, but um, this helps give an idea of ways that you could set up the physical structure in your classroom in order to give cues to your students about where they need to be, what they should be paying attention to, and what activities are available to them at that space. This particular visual comes from the STAR Autism Support um, folks, and um, so includes some of their um, terminology here. But for example, these work areas over in the corner might be a space where you would set up structured work systems in your classroom. Here's another photo um, of a classroom using physical boundaries. Um, between desks, so they've got um, these kind of office cubicle wall things, or using file cabinets. We use a lot of um, bookshelves and things like that around our rooms to create the physical boundaries to help students know where they need to be and what activities they should be doing and um, where their focus should be. In addition to setting up the environment, we also need to make sure that we've taught our students how to move around the classroom and what expectations are in each of the different areas, because it's gonna be very different from the computer area to the structured work systems area, or maybe we call it the work box area or the carpet. Now, after each of these sections, I've included some questions for you to ponder. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but if you're feeling like um, structure is something that you could work on and setting up the environment in your space, these are some questions for you to take a look at and reflect on your current practice. These come straight from the TEACH folks at North Carolina. So schedules are next, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on these because I feel like schedules are something that um, we're pretty solid on in special education. Um, they provide meaning, they increase independence and help it reduce that anxiety for our students. But I really, really wanted to emphasize that schedules are not just daily schedules for our students. It's, you know, I'm not talking about that big schedule up on the front board that most teachers have in elementary school saying what the activities are for the entire day, but breaking down those smaller act those activities into smaller steps. So example, up here in the corner, we have it during spelling time. It's not just spelling. Um, they're not just sitting down and doing spelling, a spelling test. Um, they have practice time. They're re reading the words, they're writing the words, they're typing the words, and then they're testing. Um, during this is an example down at the bottom of a speech schedule first next and last um, with interchangeable visuals that you could put in there so just knowing that um, when we're talking about schedules um, and particularly with work tasks we're talking more about mini schedules what are we expecting the student to do right at that moment and um, so these are a couple examples and we're going to see quite a few more um, when we get into the work systems but um, this one here on the left has a um, schedule that uses colored shapes and it shows the student the order of the activities with at the bottom what's next for them. Um, so the student will take those um, different shapes, match them to the work boxes that are next to them so they know um, what is the work that they need to do, how much work, they have four activities. Um, when they're done, um, all of these activities will be done and in the finished bin that should be to their right. And um, what's next is the thing that's at the bottom of their schedule. Same thing over here on the right hand side for a um, more advanced student who's working on some, looks like some workbook pages uh, or worksheets. So they, they have the schedule written in just um, with post-it notes, one, two, three, four, five. Each one uh, matches to one of the worksheets that is coming out of their little bin here. And um, so they know when they're done, where to put them. Probably there's a bin to the right. And when they're all finished, what's next? They're going for a walk. So that's all we're going to talk about with schedules specifically. Um, but you're going to see quite a few more examples. But I did include a few questions for you to ponder if schedules are something that you would like to focus on in your practice. So next up is work systems. So these are the actual organizational systems that we are setting up for our students that are going to give them all the information that they need about what's expected when they get to a particular space in the classroom. So again, these need to answer those five questions and I'm gonna just keep saying them. Where are they? What work? How much? When are they done? And what's next? Um, 
these should be systems that are as independent as possible for your students. So they should be reviewing work that they've already mastered. Um, they should be practicing maybe recently taught materials that they've been working on with you. And they should be activities that are easy, predictable, familiar for them. Uh, the more that we can make it something that's enjoyable, the more you're gonna get cooperation and see that increase in independence with your students. So this is what work systems can look like. And I say can, because there's a lots of different options that we're gonna be looking at. Um, this is kind of your traditional work box system area where the student is working from left to right. They have a schedule of tasks over here on the left-hand side. Um, this one is attached to the desk. We often have them on individual cards that the student has. The schedule indicates at the bottom what's next. They have tasks. Uh, in this case, they are set on the table for them ahead of time uh, with a clear beginning and end. Uh, so these tasks match what's on their schedule. Some students will go and get the tasks themselves off of a shelf. Others need to have them set up for them. And we work towards that independence. Uh, when they're done with their activities, they're going to put them down here in the finished bin, which in this case is a laundry basket. And we use what we can with work systems. This is another example of a basket system. Uh, this is a one, two, and done system where they have two activities to do and then they put it in a finished bin. This teacher uses um, the same bins on the same space and puts the activities in plastic bags rather than plastic shoe boxes. The shoe boxes take up a lot of space and um, putting things in the bags a little more flat um, contains all the materials, but then gives you a lot more storage space in your classroom. So this is one um, option for ways to do work boxes without um, taking up all of the valuable space that we have. Um, so um, anything else about this one? Oh, uh, you'll notice up in the top that the student does have a visual schedule. It's just kind of hidden a little bit by the baskets there. This is another example of the more traditional work box system where we have the student has their own individual schedule of which work boxes they're gonna complete. They're going to use these um, visuals to match the ones on the shelf and go get them themselves and bring them to their work table. In this case, when they are finished, they're gonna pull off the Velcro visual and put it in the, the finished envelope. Um, so this is another way that the work systems can be set up and increase that independence for your student during their work task time. Another type of work system is a to-do done work system where we're still um, helping our students with what's the work, how much, when are they done and what's next. But in this case, um, they are a little bit more portable. So if you have students who are maybe going to a DAPE class somewhere else in the building or doing um, life skills jobs around um, the school, they could have the activities that they need to complete on the left-hand side, and then they just move them over to the done side when they're completed. And I would have at the bottom what's next um, so they know what's next on their schedule. Um, these are nice because you don't have the loose pieces going into the um, finished envelope that can get easily lost, especially if they're moving around the school. Some teachers prefer to use a drawer system instead of boxes or bins. And in this case, you would have the tasks stored somewhere else and then um, choose the tasks for them ahead of time and put them in the matching drawers. So the student would still have a schedule of one, two, three, what they need to do and what they're doing um, when they're all done. But instead, and they, um, but instead of having individual boxes, everything's contained within the drawers. This teacher has right on top a finished bin where the student puts the finished activities when they're done. There's also binder systems that work really well. Um, so if you have students who are doing more um, worksheets or workbook pages or things that are um, broken down uh, more on paper pencil, um, so you would have a schedule inside of the binder and I would add a what's next at the bottom. Um, and then over here they have, oops, uh, uh, different tabs that have folders within them and each folder, each tab is labeled with a matching number. So these are nice too if students are moving from class to class or if you're in more of like a resource room setting and the student has activities they need to complete from several different classes while they're there. Folder systems are also great and another way to um, match kind of the tasks um, that your students need to get done to what your students' ability levels are. 
So um, here we have on the left-hand side, a um, bin holding several different folders and each folder is labeled um, with a number that matches the schedule down on the desk. So similar to the workbox system, except instead of um, manipulative type activities, they have paper pencil tasks that they're doing. You also um, have a couple examples here of using post-it notes on the front of a folder, and then the post-it notes have matching notes inside the folder for the student um, to complete in a particular order. And then um, also down below is a binder with separate folders in it, and each folder is labeled one, two, three. And I imagine that inside that front cover is a schedule of one, two, three, and what's next for the student. I also like that they've labeled the to-do side and the finish side of the folder so the student knows where their work goes when it's done and it's all contained in one place. Because I know, especially my middle, middle school students, they're, they do their work, but I don't know where it goes in between when they did it and it needs to get to the teacher. So if it's in that finish space, we can help it get to the right place. Then we also have the individual and whole class and or whole class system. So this is where um, you can do kind of what I did at the very beginning here, um, where you list um, the um, where should you be, what's the work, how much, when done, and what's next for everyone. So um, this was, I took this example from a middle school classroom that I was observing in a, a gen ed classroom. What did they need to do was read to self, how much they needed to read chapter two. When they were done, they were getting their Chromebook and doing a Quizlet. And what was next, they're gonna have a class discussion about the chapter. And um, you could also include where should you be at your desk. Um, this is gonna help more than just the students in special education and probably help the teacher to not have to answer these questions over and over and over again. So this could be up on the whiteboard for everyone or on an individual uh, whiteboard or piece of paper for a student at their desk. So finally, we're going to talk about visual structure. And this is how we add a physical or vis visual component to the task to help our students understand how they should complete the activity. And this includes um, instructions, organization, and clarity for them. So when we have visual instructions in place, um, sometimes the instructions really are the materials that we're presenting to the student. So um, like in this, oops, I keep touching my mouse. In this case down here, um, the, the materials themselves kind of show the student what to do. They know um, which letters they need to sort into which area just based on how the materials are set up for them. We may use things like jigs with students, which up in this upper right hand corner, um, these pictures, it's kind of a, the drawing on the napkin shows exactly where the student needs to place the items for packaging. And um, that, that color order shows them exactly what they need to do using a jig. We may have an image of a final product like down in the corner if we have the um, picture or this is a drawing but uh, I love to use photos too of what the um, ex expectation is for the final product so this is more of a fine motor and um, building activity with Legos. We may have photo instructions and this is what I've actually the template that I've been using for my work tasks um, is just showing them what are the materials, what does it look like when you're in progress, and what should it look like when it's all done. And then for students who are at a higher level who are using written lists, um, pictures that show um, what, oops, I keep touching that mouse, um, pictures that show what um, the expectation are along with a written list or um, written out instructions or directions are um, are great for providing that visual instruction and increasing independence for our kids. Next up is visual organization. And this is where we are using um, different types of containers. So we have um, the words in one container looks like a card, um, card container. And then the file, little card file. We're limiting the materials. So in this case, the student is filing the first letter behind just the letters A, B, C, D, and E. We don't need to have the entire alphabet unless they're up working up to that point. Just limiting the materials or what skills they're working on right now. Um, we are defining their workspace. So if you look at the um, sorting activity up here where they're, um, or the math activity up here they're doing, um, they have a tray 
that helps to contain all the little pieces. So they got some tiny little manipulatives here. So that tray is gonna help keep everything from rolling off of the table. The, um, the plate is gonna help keep things together. When they have um, something like an adapted book, that's keeping all of the activities within the book itself. And they've just taped um, like Velcro uh, words to match within the book on the side. So just keeping everything together and limiting it to just what you need. You can also help define a workspace on things like worksheets for students so that they know like where they are going to be placing their numbers when they're doing a math assignment. And that also provides some visual clarity for them, which we're gonna talk about next. So um, this helps us identify what's most important for the student and can do things like provide a sequence of steps. Up here, we have a task where the student is setting the table and we have a jig. So obviously they need to put the kind of jig placemat down first, then the plate, then the, the cup. So we wouldn't want them to do it in a different order. Although, you know, cup and plate could go either way, but you wanna have the jig down first. So having a, a sequence is helpful. It can also help you to know um, where the response should go or which items you're using. So down here we have a recycling system that students are working on for life skills where they have the mixed recycling over on the left and then they're sorting it. And each drawer is labeled um, both with a photo and with an actual object. And so you're thinking about your students and what um, level of support they need there. And um, so that's gonna help clarify for them where their, um, in this case, this is their response is going to go. Also, um, as we're thinking of putting together work systems for our students, including their special interests whenever you can, is gonna help increase their meaning and their um, motivation. So this is an example here of a measuring task where the student is measuring flags, which happens to be his special interest. And um, you know, using the flags is gonna hopefully motivate him a little bit more to do the assignment rather than um, just some other random rectangular objects. I know I was just creating some four piece puzzles for some students in our kindergarten program who um, really are interested in superheroes. So I went and talked to them, found out what their favorite um, superheroes were. And so I've made, made puzzles that are gonna motivate them to put together because it's something that they like. So I've included a few additional teaching and um, uh, directions type questions for you to ponder if these are some areas for you to work, to, um, to work on in your, your practice. And finally, I, I did say this was part of a um, longer training that I did together with Jill Pring in August. And these are some of the videos and resources that we had time to share during that training. And I wanted to include them here for you to watch on your own time if you're interested. And um, these YouTube videos give some really nice examples of what structured look, uh, work systems look like in action. And there's a few blogs and articles. Um, some of them, you'll recognize some of the visuals from this presentation that I stole from. And um, this one is a great visual with step-by-step -step guides for setting up uh, structured work systems in a classroom um, from the folks at STAR. And it's great for staff and, and paraprofessionals to understand kind of what it should look like. Finally, I just wanted to put in a plug for our ASD training series. Again, um, we did the structured teaching in August. And if you sign up for a training series, you will be able to access the recording of the much longer version of this training um, that will give you a little bit more in-depth information about structured teaching. Um, and then in October, here we have uh, antecedent-based interventions coming up, uh, then social skills instruction in January, and I'll be back to do executive functioning in April. So those are from um, 1 to 3 p.m. and are done virtually. And if you're interested in them, you can register with Jill Pring, and I um, included her email down here at the end. And that's it. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Wonderful, thank you, Krista. Yeah, so if people have questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and speak your question, or you can type something in the chat window, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, if you type in the chat window, I can read it aloud, or Krista will see it too. Nikki, I see your hand up, go right ahead. 
Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That was great. I work with early childhood special education. So I was kind of in my mind mentally figuring out how this could apply to three to five year olds. Oh, yeah. Um, really with one child in mind right now. But mm -hmm. um, how much of this um, like structured work system is happening in a gen ed classroom versus a special education classroom? I would say um, most of the structured work systems I've seen, I've been putting in place are in more of like a level three or special education classroom setting. However, um, especially when it comes to things like paper pencil tasks or worksheets, some of those um, organizational systems can be put into place pretty easily within a, a gen ed classroom. Um, yeah. When you have more of the like hands-on activities with all the manipulatives and things like that, um, it could be a little bit harder. However, um, the structure of work system is intended to be independent. So once the student has learned the system, you certainly could, you know, if if the student's in a gen ed classroom and this teacher ha is able to have like a space and like a little space in the yeah. corner with a desk, um, you certainly could set it up with just a bookshelf, a, de a desk and maybe a, a little finished bin in the corner, you know, on the yeah. floor or one of those one, two and done type um, yeah. setups. Could, that could work just fine if you have a, a gen ed teacher who's willing to, to work with you and make mm -hmm. provide that space in the classroom. And it's great um, if there's time in the classroom where everybody else is independent and your student is not able to be independent um, to help teach them a system like this that they could actually go and do some of their own independent work, maybe at a different level from the class or just mm -hmm. a different presentation. Cool, okay, thank you. And I should say my um, my daughter is, she just turned six and she's been helping me um, put together all of my structured work systems. And she's been begging for her own copies at home. She's like, I want the pom-pom sorting and colors. Yep. <laughs> and she wants to, she wants to sort the apples. And she's so, um, it's they're very motivating for kids. They really seem to like them a lot. I just have to find a Pikachu version of everything. Yes, yes. <laughs> I understand Did you minecraft yes <laughs> great question nikki does anyone else have any questions comments thoughts All right, if not, thank you so much, Krista, for presenting. This is a really great topic that I think can apply um, to a lot of different groups of students. I know that your area of specialty, of course, is students with autism, but um, I think it really could apply very widely. So mm -hmm. um, thanks so much for all that content. Um, I'm going to fly in and share, share the slides again and do some additional resources that are coming up. Um, let me find the right tab and I'll go through them real quickly just as we have literally one minute left. Just know that there are some additional resources out there for you. Um, Charting the Seas Conference is coming up. Project Kite, which is through PACER, which is for students who are between the ages of three through eight. They take a team of the people working with that student um, and do some assistive technology work. So that's a really great resource. You can click for more information there. The Minnesota Access Center is new and they are having open office hours that you can sign up through that link right there. And then there's they're also offering an asynchronous course on accessibility and education. And that is all through the Minnesota Department of Ed. So just know that there are some resources there. And this recording, along with all the other recordings of office hours we have done and will do, will end up on the Northland AT YouTube channel. Next week, again, we'll have Sherry Walker talking about Jamboard, the interactive whiteboard from Google, and the registration link is there. Think today about what is the just one thing. Krista shared so many good things. Um, and so feel free to take more than one thing. But sometimes in order to not be overwhelmed, it's helpful if we just pull one thing that we know that we can incorporate even today or tomorrow and start getting to work on that. And thanks so much to everyone for attending. Um, we appreciate you taking time out of your day to um, to spend time with us and get this great information. I'm going to stop recording now. But again, thanks to everyone for coming and thanks to Krista for presenting this amazing content.